Hello, listeners. It's been a while, a long while, since we featured a national park. This week, well, these next few weeks, we'll feature another national park. This national park is... Hello, Emma? Eden? It's me, Papa. Oh, Edmund, good. You're just in time to help announce the national park we're going to learn about. It has large trees, big granite towers, abundant wildlife, and majestic scenery. Do you know the national park, Edmund? I think so. Is it Yosemite? You're absolutely right. Now, before we learn more, it's time for our theme song. Edmund, there is so much about this national park that I think we need to break it up into multiple parts. I think so. So for this first part, we'll learn about its history and landforms. For the second part, we'll learn about the living organisms in the park, both plants and animals. Then for the third part, we'll share some stories from Yosemite. So for this first episode, I found that to really enjoy a place more fully, it helps to learn some of the history about the place. According to History.com, Native Americans were the main residents of the Yosemite Valley until the 1849 Gold Rush, which brought thousands of miners and settlers to the area. It was called a Gold Rush because people rushed from the populated East United States to the mostly unpopulated West. This rush brought damage to the area. So in 1864, to prevent more damage, President Abraham Lincoln declared Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove of Giant Sequoias a public trust of California. This was the first time that the U.S. government started to protect any land for the public enjoyment. And it laid the foundation for the national park system that we enjoy today. When I think of national parks, I tend to think of Theodore Roosevelt, but it was Abraham Lincoln who was first to set aside land to be protected. Yet another reason to love the already loved president. So 25 years later, in 1889, John Muir discovered that the land around Yosemite Valley was being destroyed by sheep grazing. <coughs> On October 1 of the following year, Congress set aside over 1,500 square miles of land. That's about the size of Rhode Island for what would become Yosemite National Park. There's a fairly famous picture of John Muir standing with President Theodore Roosevelt high on a cliff with Yosemite Valley in the background. There was another famous photographer who lived in Yosemite taking many pictures of it. His name was Ansel Adams, perhaps the most famous landscape photographer of his time. Abraham Lincoln, Theodore Roosevelt, John Muir, Ansel Adams, so it's fair to say that there are some big-name naturalists and conservationists associated with Yosemite National Park, perhaps more than any other place in the world. A naturalist is someone who spends time learning and studying in the natural world. A conservationist is someone who tries to protect or conserve the natural world. Naturalists and conservationists are similar. Naturalists enjoy the gift of nature, and conservationists try to find ways to protect it. I consider myself a naturalist of sorts. I enjoy being outside and like to learn about the things of nature. You too can be a naturalist. You can enjoy time outside and share that passion with others. I consider myself a conservationist of sorts. I pick up trash when I see it, and I try to teach my children at home and the students at school simple ways to take care of their environment. You, too, can be a conservationist. You can help keep the environment around you clean and teach others to do the same. Back to Yosemite. Yosemite is filled with huge, and I mean huge, rocks the size of mountains. That rock is called granite. If you look at pictures, you can see U-shaped valleys with sometimes jagged peaks around. That is some solid evidence for glaciers in the region at one point. Lots of glaciers, actually, and ice fields. You may wonder, what is a glacier? 
A glacier is basically a very slow moving river of ice. A glacier can be hundreds or even thousands of feet thick and be so unstoppable that it grinds and carves out huge sections of mountains as it flows downhill. The rate of flow for a glacier can't be seen. It may only be a few inches or a few feet a year. So it's not like an avalanche. An avalanche is quick and dangerous to humans, but basically leaves the mountain untouched. A glacier is similar, but it is much thicker, heavier, and leaves sections of the mountain gouged out. After time, snow and ice from the glacier eventually melt if the atmosphere warms up. Papa, I want to know something. If glaciers went away, then how do we know they were even there in the first place? That's an excellent question. Here's a little example from my backyard. I walked outside and into my yard. I saw a muddy pit and realized that you, Edmund, were digging with a shovel, or had been. How could I tell that you were digging there? Because you saw a muddy pit. Exactly. There is evidence left in the yard that someone was digging. In Yosemite, there is a famous valley called Yosemite Valley. It is a U shaped valley with granite cliffs and peaks surrounding it. How could that valley have been created? One strong suggestion with plenty of evidence is that a large river of ice or a glacier gouged out that valley over a bunch of years, and after it melted, it left behind a place for people to visit. So, there is good evidence that glaciers were in the area, simply by looking around and seeing the remains. So, back to the granite. It's an igneous rock. Do you listeners remember what igneous means from the episode about Yellowstone? Igneous sounds like the word ignite. It means fire. Igneous rocks were hot rocks once underground, like magma, and were pushed up to the surface. Granite is one of many types of igneous rocks. Obsidian is another one. Obsidian is like glass because it cooled very quickly. Since it didn't have time to crystallize, it remained like glass. Think of honey. Over time, you can start to form honey crystals. Rocks do similar things. So if obsidian is like glass and cooled very quickly, granite, which has crystal-like formations in it, must have cooled... Slowly! Definitely. It had time to create little structures. By the way, granite is the most common type of igneous rock in the world. Yosemite's most famous landforms are made of granite. This all means that there has been volcanic activity somewhere underground in the past, but obviously not now. Anyway, Yosemite's most famous landforms are Pothole Dome, Fairview Dome, Lambert Dome, Cathedral Peak, and the most famous by far are El Capitan and Half Dome. Half Dome and especially El Capitan bring many rock climbers to the park, an estimated 25 to 50,000 rock climbers every year. Some people climb El Capitan over multiple days. Others do it in a single day. In recent years, Alex Honnold climbed El Capitan without ropes at all and completed it within a matter of hours. I don't recommend anyone trying it ever. Yosemite not only has meadows, wildflowers, Half Dome, and El Capitan, it also has Yosemite Falls. At almost a half a mile high, Yosemite Falls is one of the highest waterfalls in the world. Wow! I know, what doesn't Yosemite have? Those are just some of the reasons why about 4 million people visit Yosemite every year. Some of you may like to visit. We've been there. Do you remember any of it, Edmund? Of course I remember. So if you would like to visit, you may want to know when. While I could say any time of the year, unless you want to snowshoe in and risk being lost in snow, it's the same as most national parks in North America. Spring, summer, and fall are best. Any time between May and September will be wonderful. Earlier in the season means some roads may still be closed due to snow, however, so if you plan to visit, call the ranger station and plan ahead. You may want to know where to visit. A national park is usually a large park, and Yosemite is no exception. It is huge. 
I've been to multiple points in the park, and even though many people might say Yosemite Valley's the best, there's almost too much to see, and it's crowded. It can be crowded anyway. When I went, I felt like I wanted to go hiking here and there and everywhere all at once, but I was stuck behind an RV going 20 miles per hour. It wasn't very much fun. My favorite place to go is to Alamany Meadows. It's a little tricky to pronounce. <laughs> My first backpacking trip in Yosemite went to Cathedral Lakes near Cathedral Peak. That trip starts in Tuolumne Meadows, and it's gorgeous. There are fewer people, a large open meadow, creeks, rivers, granite domes, and it's so gorgeous I feel ready to go right now. Papa, we need to finish recording first. Yes, I know, you're right. Let's record this first, then we'll get some snowshoes. So what to do in Yosemite? Once you're there, you can go hiking, backpacking, fishing, or you can take it easy and stay at one of their cabins, yurts, or hotels. Yosemite has its share of wilderness, but the National Park Service has provided many amenities to make your stay more comfortable. Wow, so much to see and do. I'm eager to make my way back to the incredible, fantastic Yosemite National Park. There is even more to learn about in our next episode. I want to say thank you again to those who have been supporting the podcast through Patreon. If you're interested in supporting this podcast, please look for a link in the show notes, leave a review, or consider purchasing a t-shirt. They are only $10 right now until the end of the year. I'm Moose Jaw Matt. Until next time, keep exploring your world.